Hello, 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 and once again, the crew and I are coming to you from an undisclosed location to protect the innocent. Well, really, to protect me and my family. And uh, we got lots of stuff to talk about today and can only scratch just a little teeny piece of it. So hang on, we're going to cover what we can. The topics tonight, today, whichever it is, climate change, Joe Biden... And Fauci gets pummeled again. All right. Well, 60-plus people just died in Hurricane Ida uh, from the south to the uh, upper east coast. And there's possibly hundreds of Americans still left behind in Afghanistan. We're hearing reports of five or six planes that can't lift off. We're also hearing the media say that's a lie. It's kind of a strange lie, but we'll find out later about that. But Biden takes this moment uh, while he's touring uh, the destruction from Ida to make a plug for his Build Back Better Again program. And uh, he talks about how this program, this government program, is actually somehow going to defeat climate change. Uh, That's if you actually believe that we really are going through climate change, uh, at least as described by the media. So I'm going to play this clip for you. It's uh, Biden talking about how his program is the answer to all these questions. And then we'll be right back. The evidence clear. Climate change poses an existential Mm -hmm. threat to our lives, to our economy. And the threat is here. It's not going to get any better. The question, can it get worse? We can stop it from getting worse. And when I talk about building back better, and Chuck is fighting for my program, our program on the Hill, when I talk about building back better, I mean you can't build to what it was before this last storm. You got to build better so if the, the storm occurred again, there would be no damage. There would be. But that's not going to stop us, though, because if we just do that, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse because the storms are going to get worse and worse and worse. And so, folks, we've got to listen to the scientists and the economists and the national security experts. They all tell us this is code red. The nation and the world are in peril. That's not hyperbole. That is a fact. They've been warning us the extreme weather would get more extreme over the decade, and we're living in real time now. Well, we hear all the time... uh, in the media, that 97% of all scientists agree, there's a consensus that uh, climate change is real, that it's all caused by humans, and that we're headed for a disaster if we don't fix it. I want you to focus on the 97% consensus. I'm going to read you from an article here. It's called Putting the Con in Consensus. Not only is there no 97% consensus among climate scientists, many misunderstand the core issues. Now, this is an article that appeared in Financial Post, May of 2015. And I know you're saying, well, Wally, that's six years old. The reason I'm reading it is the 97% number is still being touted out there today. So I want to bring up uh, the points that this guy made uh, in his article and Um, what was his name here? Ross McKittrick, okay? He made these points back in uh, May of 2015, but they're relevant because, again, the 97% is still being talked about. And I'm just going to read you some excerpts from it. I printed it off. I don't know if you can see that there. That is the the title of the article, so you can look it up from fraserinstitute.org. Org, Fraser Institute, F R A S E R Institute.org. Here's some uh, excerpts from that. One of the most powerful rhetorical weapons being deployed is the claim that 97% of the world's scientists agree what the problem is and what we have to do about it. I go on. I'm just, I'm not going to quote and unquote. This whole thing is from. Uh, the phrase, the financial post. First of all, on what exactly are 97% of the experts supposed to agree? 
In 2013, U.S. President Barack Obama sent out a tweet claiming 97% of climate experts believe global warming is real, man-made, and dangerous. As it turns out, the survey he was referring to didn't ask that question, so he was basically making it up. At a recent debate in New Orleans, I heard climate activist Bill McKibben claim there was a consensus that greenhouse gases are a grave danger. But when challenged for the source of his claim, he promptly withdrew it. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the IPCC. These people are great with this stuff, aren't they? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change asserts the conclusion that most, more than 50%, of the post-1950 global warming is due to human activity, chiefly greenhouse gas emissions and land use change. But it does not survey its own contributors, let alone anyone else, so we do not know how many experts agree with that. And the statement, even if true, does not imply that we face a crisis requiring massive restructuring of the worldwide economy. In fact, it is consistent with the view that the benefits of fossil fuel use greatly outweigh the climate-related costs. The most highly cited paper supposedly found 97% of published scientific studies support man-made global warming. But in addition to poor survey methodology, that tabulation is often misrepresented. Most papers, 66%, actually took no position. Of the remaining 34%, 33% supported at least a weak human contribution to global warming. So divide 33 by 34 and you get 97%. Of course, it left out the 66. But this is unremarkable since the 33% includes many papers that critique key elements of the IPCC position. In 2012, the American Meteorological Society, AMS, surveyed its 7,000 members, receiving 1,862 responses. Of those, only 52% said they think global warming over the 20th century has happened and is mostly man-made which is the IPCC position. The remaining 48% either think it happened, but natural causes explain at least half of it, or it didn't happen, or they don't know. Furthermore, 53% agree that there is conflict among the AMS members on the question. So, no sign of a 97% consensus. Not only do half reject the IPCC conclusion, More than half acknowledge that their profession is split on the issue. Three-quarters of respondents disagreed or strongly disagreed with the statement, climate is chaotic and cannot be predicted. Here is what the IPCC said in its 2003 report. In climate research and modeling, we should recognize that we are dealing with a coupled, non-linear, nonlinear, chaotic system, and therefore that the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. What can we take away from all of this? First, lots of people get called climate experts and contribute to the appearance of consensus without necessarily being knowledgeable about core issues. A consensus among the misinformed is not worth much. Second, it is obvious that the 97% mantra is untrue. The underlying issues are so complex it is ludicrous to expect unanimity. The near 50-50 split among AMS members on the role of greenhouse gases is a much more accurate picture of the situation. The phony claim of 97% consensus is mere political rhetoric aimed at stifling debate and intimidating people into science. I thought that was a fairly balanced report. Didn't say that uh, climate change doesn't exist, but it certainly put the 97% consensus in, uh, in perspective. Okay, so where are we in this thing? 
The next thing we're going to look at is some disinformation story on Fauci. Fauci makes a claim on this clip that, uh, well, Fauci and the news, CNN news commentator, make a report that people like Tucker Carlson and uh, what's his name? Joe Rogan are the are the problem. They're spewing disinformation. Never addresses any of his own disinformation. And we are going to look at his un- unprecedented level of disinformation, which most of you uh, are probably already aware of. Let's go ahead and go to the clip. It was published, which I'll get to in a second, by Rolling Stone, an outlet known for uh, its hoaxes. Remember the uh, North Carolina, the Duke, uh, North Carolina rape story? Yeah. So Rolling Stone has a uh, a tarred reputation with the truth. But uh, I'll get to that in a second because here's Fauci this weekend on with Jim Acosta. And it's interesting how Fauci brings up misinformation being the problem with COVID, yet he doesn't bring up any of the ivermectin hoaxes, the Wuhan lab hoax. I'll get to that in a second, too. Here's Fauci the fake, this phony Fauci again. Misinformation. The misinformation's coming from Fauci and his team. Listen to this hack. Did you ever expect that you would have, I guess, to compete with the likes of Tucker Carlson and and Joe Rogan, uh, Dr. Fauci? And are their voices uh, more powerful uh, and, I guess, more widespread than uh, people like yourself, uh, other public health experts who are out there? And isn't that part of the problem? Well, uh, Jim, disinformation and misinformation is really a very serious issue when it comes to a public health issue like COVID-19. This is incredible. Glad you stood and watched that. That video is uh, from Dan Bongino's uh, Rumble podcast or video cast, vlog, whatever those things are called. And I highly recommend Dan Bongino. He's at least half entertainment, but I don't find him spewing out information that he's not researched. So if you want some entertainment and some facts, check out Dan Bongino's Rumble podcast, vlogcast, whichever. Okay. The next clips we're going to be looking at is uh, also from Bongino. Dan, I hope you don't mind that I'm taking your stuff. Uh, I I just love the way you produce some of this stuff. You've got more resources available to you than I do. I'm giving a total hat tip to your uh, video for where I'm getting the information. But this was the recent ivermectin story, which probably most of you are familiar with, where there were claims that in Oklahoma, uh, some rural hospital was being just absolutely overwhelmed by ivermectin patients, and to the point that they were having to refuse gunshot victims. Let's go ahead and take a look at the clip. This weekend, here's a tweet they put out on their blue check mark account. They're very serious. Rolling Stone, gunshot victim. Joe, Joe, you got to say this with drama. Yeah. Gunshot victims left waiting as dewormer overdoses overwhelm Oklahoma hospitals, doctor says. Rolling Stone was like, whoa. Horse dewormer, ODs, Odizzles everywhere. Oklahoma kicking out gunshot people. Everybody, oh, ivermectin, horse paste overdose. I'm not, uh, doc, help me. Gunshot victim. Get, get away, gunshot victim. I took horse paste. This everywhere. Hospital was overwhelmed. Fascinating. Can you go back to that a second? One more thing. I did. Notice the picture, by the way. The picture in the tweet. <laughs> If you're watching on Rumble, don't, don't say, Joe, I know you caught it. I know you probably caught it. So if you're watching or if you're not watching, if you're just listening at home, in the tweet about Oklahoma hospitals being overwhelmed with O-Dizzles from ivermectin, they have a photo of a line that appears to be a line to get into the hospital. You notice something funny. My sister lives in Oklahoma. She lives in uh, Oklahoma City. Her husband's a doctor, by the way, so I'm quite familiar with the Oklahoma uh, situation out there. We are in, uh, last time I checked, Joe, let me just check the calendar just to be sure. It is September, yeah, correct, here it Joe? Is. So I guess it is there, too. September yeah. 7th. Uh-huh. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Joe says it's September here, so he accurately states it is likely, although Joe's worried about the fact checks, <laughs> it's likely 
September in Oklahoma too. Good call, Joe. I like the way, you. you know, you caveat that because you do have fact checkers out there, you know, who uh, they, they seem obsessed with us, you know, 24-7, 365. It's interesting how Oklahoma, which is very hot, I spend a lot of time out there, people have hats on, hoodies, triple fat gooses, <laughs> boots, thermal gear. Picture was taken on January, folks. That's a vaccine line outside of a church. But of course, Rolling Stone specialists in fake news in order to make it appear grave, have a bunch of people lined up and they think it's a line to get in the hospital. Here's the update from Rolling Stone. I couldn't show it to you in a way that would have been easy to read. So I'm going to read it to you. This is the update from them on the uh, ivermectin story. Update. One hospital has denied Dr. Jason McLeah's claim that ivermectin overdoses are causing emergency room backlogs and delays in medical care in rural Oklahoma, and Rolling Stone has been unable to independently verify any such cases as of the time of this update. That's pretty substantial, folks. Can't verify any of them. The National Poison Data System states there were 459 reported cases of ivermectin overdose in the United States, the whole country, in August. Oklahoma's specific ivermectin overdose figures are not available. But the count is unlikely to be a significant factor in hospital bed availability in a state that, per the CDC, currently has a seven-day average of 1,528 COVID-19 hospitalizations. The doctor that was mentioned is affiliated with a medical staffing group that serves multiple hospitals in Oklahoma. Following widespread publication of his statements, one hospital that the doctor's group serves, NHS Sequoia, said its ER has not treated any ivermectin overdoses, and that it has not had to turn away anyone seeking care. This and other hospitals that the doctor's group serves did not respond to requests for comment, and the doctor has not responded to requests for further comment. We will update if we receive more information. That's pretty good, folks. After watching the clip, I'm not going to beat this to death, but Bongino and crew did a great job of uh, running down the truth behind that ivermectin story. Uh, and, and like you said, there's got to be a reason. Why is everybody against ivermectin? You're calling it the horse drug or the horse paste. Uh, and actually, it was approved, and, and the guy who, who came up with the, uh, the human use received a, an award of some kind in 2015. So yes, it is approved for human use. That's all part of the lie, as he talked about. The next thing we're going to look at is Fauci gets straightened out as media forced to admit that he lied. Now, if you've been following any of this, you know that he and Rand Paul have been having an ongoing battle with Rand Paul questioning him and Fauci constantly just denying everything he says. Well, folks, the time is over for Fauci, at least on this issue, to be able to keep lying. This is from the Epic Times. New documents have been released, and this is today, uh, detailing U.S.-funded research on various types of coronaviruses at the Wuhan Institute of Virology in Wuhan, China, where the first outbreak of the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, virus occurred. More than 900 pages of materials were obtained by The Intercept in connection with a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit brought by the publication against the National Institutes of Health. The documents detail the work of the EcoHealth Alliance, a U.S.-based health organization that used federal money to fund research into bat coronaviruses at the Chinese lab. They include two previously unpublished grant proposals funded by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, as well as project updates related to EcoHealth's Alliance research. One of the grants awarded by the NIH to the EcoHealth Alliance, understanding the risk of bat coronavirus emergence, amounted to $666,422. Yes, 
Fauci's group gave them the money, but no big deal, according to Fauci. Let's take a look at a clip from Fox News. Dr. Fauci under fire defending the move to fund the Wuhan lab now. Listen. We had a modest collaboration with very respectable Chinese uh, uh, scientists who are world experts on coronavirus. The subgrant was about $600,000 over a period of five years. So it was a modest amount. Have you ever had a grantee lie to you? I cannot guarantee that a grantee has not lied to us because you never know. Hmm. Now, some House Republicans, including our next guest, want him fired. GOP Congressman Guy Reschenthaler joins us now. He sits on the House China Task Force, and we know she'd said this earlier this week. Um, what in particular put you over the edge with Anthony Fauci? Because I have my own list. Yeah, Brian, thanks for having me on, and uh, please just call me Guy. You know, I was skeptical of Dr. Fauci from the very beginning of this. And remember, Fauci has been wrong over and over again. Early on, and back in January, he said America has nothing to worry about regarding this virus. He then criticized President Trump for the travel ban from China. And then he said that that decision by President Trump actually saved lives. He blatantly lied to Congress about masks and the American people saying they don't help. And then he said that, oh, no, I was lying so we could hoard PPE. He's been wrong this entire time. And when Tom Cotton and myself were saying that this virus probably originated in a lab in Wuhan, the lab where they were doing gain of function research on zoonotic bat borne diseases, he was the one saying that was a conspiracy theory. He was the one pushing the real conspiracy theory that this virus originated in nature. And it's not politics, but man, he's political. And if you see when he hopped on with Rachel Maddow and he said, I love your show, they wouldn't let me do your show. Who the heck is, he's a biologist. Why does he want to do a late night show like Johnny Carson's going to give him his big break? He was also wrong when it came to surfaces. Remember, we were hosing down our cereal boxes. He was wrong when it came to masks. He still was wearing them indoors up until two weeks ago. Evidently, he knew the difference, but he was putting us on. He also was uh, wrong when he said no danger. And of course, uh, he was wrong when it talked about about the origin. He said that there was no I, there was no there was no credence to that theory when this thing called logic played a role. Is he intentionally deceptive or is there something else to this? He's either grossly incompetent or he's been lying to the American people the entire time. And, and look, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a scientist, but just look at the evidence. If you were to believe Dr. Fauci and the fact that this originated in nature, a wet market, you'd have to believe that a bat a thousand miles away from Wuhan traveled to Wuhan, again, a thousand miles, infected no species, no human along the way, then started infecting people at the, around Wuhan where there was the BSL-4 lab studying, again, the coronavirus and bat borne diseases. And that once that virus leaked, it became 20%, I'm sorry, 20 times more contagious than it was in the state of nature. To me, that's just that, that just defies logic. Also, we know in November, back in November, people in the Wuhan Institute of Virology were getting COVID-like symptoms. To me, the evidence is staggering. Dr. Fauci should be fired or resign. I don't understand how he can do his job on be on 12 shows a day and every single Sunday show. There's something really off about this. Uh, Congressman, thanks so much for doing this. Appreciate it. Now, Fauci, according to that clip, does say in 2012 that the risk of pandemic was worth it. I went and did a little research to dig that up. Isn't it nice that people in your government have the power to risk your life without your permission? This isn't draft during wartime, folks. This is individuals making decisions uh, like Fauci that don't have your best interest in mind, even though they say they do. Here's the actual quote from what Fauci said in 2012. Despite the risks involved, Fauci called gain-of-function experiments important work in his 2012 writing. Quote, in an unlikely but conceivable turn of events, what if that scientist becomes infected with the virus, which leads to an outbreak and ultimately triggers a pandemic? Many ask reasonable questions. Given the possibility of such a scenario, however remote, should the initial experiments have been performed and or published in the first place, and what were the processes involved in this decision? 
Uh, I'm going to go on with the quote here. But I want, in an unlikely but conceivable turn of events, and then at the end of that he says, however remote. He, he, he is so good at this. Uh, unlikely but conceivable, however remote. Okay, we, we've covered all the bases there, so he doesn't have to be tied down to any singular position. Continuing on in that 2012 uh, article, this is Fauci again. Scientists working in this field might say, as indeed I have said, that was Fauci, that the benefits of such experiments and the resulting knowledge outweigh the risks. Stopping again, folks. Let me read that, read that again. Scientists working in this field might say, as I indeed have said, Fauci indeed agreed, that the benefits of such experiments and the resulting knowledge outweigh the risks. What risk? The risk, the risk that he said up here that could cause an outbreak and ultimately trigger a pandemic. Fauci saying that's worth it. Back to Fauci's quoting. It is more likely that a pandemic would occur in nature and the need to stay ahead of such a threat is a primary reason for performing an experiment that might appear to be risky. Within the research community, many have expressed concern that important research progress could come to a halt just because of the fear that someone somewhere might attempt to replicate these experiments sloppily. This is a valid concern, unquote. So he says that the, the likelihood is the pandemic would occur in nature. What we're finding out now is the pandemic likely didn't occur in nature. It likely occurred from a laboratory, okay? But Fauci was willing to take that risk, okay? And, and this is unbelievable. And uh, in this next clip we're gonna take a look at, Hannity uh, talks about Fauci's faux pas uh, throughout the years and what should be done with him. And when you think about that, Fauci's decision that we should, be, we should go ahead and fund or help fund research for this bat virus. This is the result of a couple political tools, or better said, political fools. They're playing with your life for the purpose of making money. Making money, yep. Delivering a pandemic that will require a vaccination that will be used around the world and be paid for by the government is a way of making money. Bill Gates and his company are renowned for their work and pay for play in the vaccine world. Look it up. You'll find out what I'm saying is true. Don't think that was a plan? I got a little thing for you to watch. Watch Event 201. Now, you're going to have to have some time. I, I think it's three or four hours long. You have to watch at least the first 45 minutes of it. Event 201 was a play, if you will, put together, which included many of the players that actually were in the... Um, beginning of the pandemic and the rollout of the pandemic. It was funded by Gates, okay? So watch the first 45 minutes or so of Event 201 and ask yourself, is it really possible that somebody could guess that well what would happen? I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory. I want you to watch it for yourselves. Right now, we're going to go to that Hannity clip. You read Gain of Function what the NIH defini a definition is. And, you know, you take an animal virus, you increase transmissibility to humans, and that's gain of function. He denied that's gain of function, but that's what his own NIH defines as gain of function. Help me out with that. I think the reasoning behind him being so resistant, so livid, and so full of ad hominem is he realizes that once the public realizes that the NIH under his leadership funded the Wuhan lab, that is beyond question they did, the NIH funded the lab, but once the public figures out that they were doing very, very dangerous research there, gain of function research, taking animal viruses and making them more transmissible into humans. Once everybody puts this together, he realizes where the blame's going to attach. He has at least tangential responsibility. If this came from the lab that he was funding, my goodness, can you imagine the moral culpability that the man has? But you also have to place this in context. Since 2012, he has said repeatedly that 
Yes, an accident can happen, but the research is worth it. Even if an accident were to cause a worldwide pandemic, the research is worth it. Well, that's all the news anyone can take for one sitting, folks. We're in difficult times, I know. But I want you to remember God is still in control. God is still on the throne. And those in the government that are lying to us, those in the government that are abusing us and abusing their liberties and taking away our liberties, we'll answer to God. The Bible tells us that the governments that exist are placed in their positions by God. That doesn't mean God's responsible for their sin. He has instituted governments to help for the good of mankind. They're supposed to benefit us. Well, they're not. And they will answer to God. They don't have to answer to us, folks. Don't try to decide how you're going to get up and start an armed war. Live your life. Do the best you can with what you've got. Speak truth every chance you get. Do not fall into the trap of saying, well, you know, that all these people believe it. It must be true. That is so far from reality. The more the media tells you about what's true, the less you should believe them. They have an ulterior motive, folks, and that's to subjugate us. Again, we all die. Death is coming to every person on the planet. It always has. It always will. There is a judgment day according to to the Bible. And these government leaders will stand in front of the ultimate judge where there is no call your next witness. When you stand there in front of God Almighty, you know he is the ultimate judge and you will answer for your sin without being covered by the blood of Jesus. That's the only thing that can save them. It's the only thing that can save us, the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll tune in again next time to Wally Roderick and the News. God bless.